welcome to Playwrights Roundtable, a half-hour showcase of original plays written and produced and directed right here in our own Central Florida by the organization Playwrights Roundtable. And today we're going to watch West Farms, an original play written by Joseph Hayes and directed by Chuck Dent. Hi. So welcome. I look forward to talking with you right after we watch West Farms. So sit back and relax and enjoy the play West Farms. in the Bronx called West Farms. Uh, yeah, it ain't no farm, see. What it is is this uh, big place with concrete islands, you know, where uh, all the buses drive around and uh, park at, uh, depot-like. Yeah, you know, you get off of one bus and uh, uh, you get on another one. Man, that, that was the best place in the world when I was a kid, because, you know, uh, any place you wanted to go, you could go straight from there like, like magic. You know, Castle Hill. Pelham Bay, Park Chester. You get off of one bus and uh, you get on another one. Well, it, it wasn't always magic, though. Uh, there were all these creepy guys walking up and down them concrete islands, you know, uh, hunting for the change people would drop, you know, when they's uh, running for the buses. Uh, yeah, homeless, only, you know, uh, we didn't call them homeless back then. Everybody knew what they wanted the money for was the bar, and in West Farms, the bar meant you walk under the elevated, you know, the uh, subway only up. It was the elevated if you walked under it, it was the trains if you was in it. Anyway, you walk under the elevated and you walk into the Metropolitan. Now, uh, the Metropolitan was, uh, pardon my French, a nudie bar. They had these girls dancing right on the bar, and they don't wear nothing but, you know, these uh, little string things and these uh, tape circles on their nipples, like. But, but the best thing about the Metropolitan is you could stand at the window when you was out in the street and, and, and press your face up against the glass. And, and, and if you uh, look true to Venetians and close one eye and kind of squint with the other, yeah, every once in a while you might see one of them girls dancing on the bar. Hey, that's a lot of work for a guy who's 11, you know, standing around with one and a half eyes closed, you know, looking like some freaking pirate, you know, trying to see some naked girl. Yeah, anyway, upstairs from the Metropolitan is a gym, or a real boxing gym. My brother Danny, he was a prize fighter. Well, I tell a lie. Yeah, he never won no prize, but he was there every day just about. And they had this uh, trainer there named Ricketts. Uh, his uh, face was pushed off to one side, you know, like he was smushed up against the window. You know, like uh, maybe he uh, spent too much time outside the Metropolitan, if you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, this one day, out of the blue, my brother starts complaining about the food on the lunch table. He starts yelling, Ricketts, Yo, Joe Ricketts, what is the deal with the table? Hey, Danny, they got them good bologna sandwiches. Yeah, shut up, Squirt. Yo, Ricketts, I can't eat this crap. What you want me to do, starve? And what exactly did you be want to appear on the table, Daniel? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe something. Maybe some, some donuts or... Yeah, some donuts. That'd be good. Donuts, is it? Ah, oh, give me your donuts. When you're the damn heavyweight champion of the world, that's when you'll get your damn donuts. And you'll eat what's on the table or you'll eat your own shite and see if I care, you bastard. Hey, Willie. What's a shite to you? <laughs> so they don't get no donuts. That's all I'm saying. Everybody goes back to sparring, but you know, there ain't no talk because everybody knows Ricketts don't go no place. He's standing in the hole with a cigarette sticking out of his crooked mouth listening. So everybody's putting on this big show, you know, like these really working. 
yeah, a couple guys over by the ring, you know, they're uh, smacking each other in the chest, you know, with empty gloves, going, whap, 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 you know, like they're beating the crap out of each other. And I turn around, I'm laughing, and then Danny by the bevy bag, and he's punching. He, he's really upset, and he's got that face. Oh, I hate that face. I, I, I think Danny boxes goes in the ring, he can hit back, but he don't never get that face in the ring. That's a face he gets at the house after he's done getting beat. That's that's my pop's face. Anyway, he's pounding that bag. He's hitting like some kind of freaking machine, you know, left, right, same spot over and over again, left, right. And I get kind of scared. And I see right there that my brother Danny, he, he may never win no prize, but he sure as hell was a fighter. Hey, hey, Danny, uh, when's that Golden Gloves fight again? I want to make sure I tell Pops the right day. Uh, maybe he'll come this time, because it's such a big deal, you think? You know what? You know, if I stand here in this corner and I wait for the 7.14 p.m. number 20 Morris Avenue bus to go by, you know, you know, I can see Pops. He'll be sitting on the right side in the middle just staring out the front. And you know, if I were to get on that bus headed towards Valentine Avenue, I could get off the bus right at the luncheonette where he works. And if, if Pops were to get on that bus and stop right there, at the bus stop that is right there, in front of this building, you know, you know, he could walk up those stairs, you know, he could see me, he could see me working out. He could, he could see me fighting. My pops could see me doing something that I can do good. Do you know what? He never will. So I never will. Because he don't respect what I do no more than I don't respect what he does. But he's our pops, right? It's the big fight. He's got to care. Right, Danny? Right? Sure, Squirt. Sure. Now, I ain't never seen my brother Danny cry before. I, I ain't never seen him cry since. So, you know, maybe he wasn't crying. It, it could have been sweat. It just looked like it. That's all I'm saying. Now, now go on, get out of here, all right? And if I catch you looking at them boobies again, <laughs> I'm gonna break your face, you hear me? You get off of one bus, you get on another bus. Sir. I get on a bus, I go home. About two weeks later, I'm back in front of the Metropolitan. Got my face up against the window, I'm getting ready to go upstairs. In my pocket, I got a, a piece of the Daily News, you know, the ad for the boxing match, the Golden Gloves fight, you know, which is uh, tomorrow. Only uh, I can't go. You know, because Danny and Pops, they had their own fight, and. Pop said, I got to stay home. You know, Danny talks back. I get in trouble. I, you know, I can never understand that crap, but, you know, there you go. Anyway, I'm in front of the Metropolitan. I'm getting ready to leave, and, and I think I see something true to Venetians. And my brother Danny at the bar. Well, it looks like him anyway, but, but it couldn't be him. He would never set foot in the bar. I know, because Ma always used to send him to tell Pops to come home, and he always hated that place. So oh, it just couldn't be him, man. And without even thinking about what I'm doing, I walk into the Metropolitan. It, it was dark and crowded, and all these guys are standing around talking and laughing and smoking, and, and everybody's drinking in it, and it smells like old pee. And there's them girls walking back and forth on the bar, you know, like these outside waiting for a bus. And there's all these man noises, yeah, you know, to kind of make your eyes pop wide open and your mouth go all dry when you're 11. You know, like you just heard some grown-up secret that you wasn't supposed to. And there's Danny, laying across the bar like he'd been sucker punched in the third round and all his boxing buddies are standing around with beers in their hands. And one of his pals, Frankie, he sees me and he comes up and says, uh, 
Hey, Squirt, what are you doing here, huh? You come to see the chip? <laughs> We're taking bets on how long it'll take Susie here to step on his tongue. <laughs> Hey, Danny, are you all right? What's the matter with him? Does he need a doctor? Hey, what the champ needs is to go home and sleep it off and then get himself a job as a janitor because he sure as heck ain't no boxer. <laughs> Danny falls onto the floor and Frankie goes into a 10 count. One! <laughs> Two! <laughs> Well, Danny, he thinks he's back in the gym, and he starts throwing punches all over the place, and, and one of those punches, you know, nails Frankie in the jaw, and Frankie comes back and punches him in the chest. Hey, stop that. He's got a fight tomorrow. You never heard a noisy room go so quiet so fast. Just the noise of the pieces of, of glass falling onto the sidewalk. Uh, I've never seen so much blood. Uh, my brother's blood. My, my brother Danny's blood. Uh, the cops come with an ambulance and, and uh, they put him in the back to take him to Montefiore Hospital. Uh, I, I want to get in the back and go with him, but you know, they tell me no. So I, I'm backing away as they're closing the doors, and, and I hear all of Danny's boxing buddies standing around laughing. And just then, the 7.14 p.m., number 20, Morris Avenue bus pulls up. And there's Pops, middle of the bus, right-hand side, staring out the front. All the lights and the cops and me standing right there and he don't see nothing. He's just staring out the window like he's driving. And the bus stops right in front of me. And the doors open up and the driver says, uh, Hey kid, you getting on? I shake my head. No. And he closes the doors, and then he, he, the bus pulls away. And I stand there, and I watch as my pop floats away behind the window on them big rubber tires of that number 20 bus as it slowly drives around them concrete islands at West Farms. And then takes him home. I got home about an hour later. Danny, he didn't get home till the next day. And his hand was all wrapped up with a bandage like a mummy. We never talked about it, none of us, not once. Danny, he didn't get no fights after that. His hand never came back, he couldn't. Uh... Uh, hey, he's in Ohio now, you know, Toledo, Ohio. Yeah, I tell you something funny. He's got himself a gym, you know, a real boxing gym. Ain't that a pisser? Yeah, I talk to him a lot, and uh, he sounds pretty good. And so I guess that's going okay. Ma, Ma passed about five years ago. Pops, he uh, he, he drunk himself to death in '85. Uh, at least that's what I heard. Uh, Danny and me, we ain't been talking to him for about t uh, ten years by then, and. Uh, I heard about it, or maybe I read it, I, I, I don't know. Oh, oh, look it. Hey, remember that uh, piece of the Daily News, you know, the box and that? Yeah, I know it's uh, kind of falling apart, but uh, I still got it. You know, uh, one of these days, I, I, I ought to get Danny to sign it. Yeah. That would be good. That was a very beautiful play. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short intermission, and when I come back, we're going to talk with Joseph and then Chuck about West Farms. Stay with us.
I think Danny Box is cool as in the ring. He can hit back, but he don't never get that face in the ring. That, that's a face he gets at the house after he's done getting beat. You've just watched another quick clip from West Farms, an original play written by Joseph Hayes and directed by Chuck Dent. Welcome to Playwrights Roundtable, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks. So tell me, Joseph, is West Farms an original place up north? It's an actual place okay. in, in New York in the county called the Bronx, okay. notorious in song and story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a bus depot, still a working bus depot, a very important part of the community. Uh, where most people in the area go through at least once in their lives. And were you raised there? I was raised near there, uh, uh, born and lowered in the Bronx, as a friend of mine says, uh, and spent uh, at least half of my life there. I was there until my 20s, so um, I know the area very well. It was a, a big part of my childhood. I used to pass through West Farms on the way from my house to where my father worked. Um, which was a luncheonette, as it, <laughs> as it is in the play. Some things uh, in the play are biographical and many things aren't, and it's really not my job to tell you which ones. <laughs> and I can respect that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you painted a, a beautiful picture. I mean, visually, as we were watching it, we could really immerse ourselves into the story. I actually could see buildings, I could see places, and a, a lot of that, I'm sure, is attributed to your directing that. How did you come up with the ideas of, of placing us in those different time periods and blocking that? Well, that was something we were really conscious of when we were doing it, and it's something that I made the actors aware of, too. Everything in this, in this play is very specific. You have the window, you have the bar, you have the stairs going up to the gym, you have Danny standing in the corner looking out the window. I mean, I said, I, I told my, my actors, the only way we're going to be able to sell this being real with just these two things on stage is establish the place and make it as real to you as possible and the audience will see that and thank you I think it worked so it did uh, it, really it, it did. was very interesting to see that come mm -hmm. about now, both actors were, were very dynamic uh, when you went through the audition process and, and selected them what what grabbed you about about each of them playing those roles yes Chuck what did grab you about yes, them? Chuck. <laughs> um, well um, Eric has has actually done that play once, um, and it was a no-brainer. I'm, I'm sure we could have auditioned more people, but in in my mind, I, I couldn't think of anyone off the top of my head that was like, hmm, that would that would take the place. Now, David David was a bit of a find. Um, we we actually had to go through a couple of people to find the right person for that, and David just he is a boxer first of all in in, oh, in actual life. Uh, okay. As well as an actor, so he's obviously you can see in the in the in the show he's very fit, but he actually knows the the sweet science, so it it made it very easy to to bring about that part of the character. But then it was, you know, he had the the vulnerability in there as well, and that's that's what sold me on him. Hmm. Joseph, is this your first collaboration with playwrights? Uh, technically, yes and no. <laughs> okay. Um, Playwrights Roundtable was kind enough to ask to do West Farms last year in 2006 for their spring uh, festival and then I was very pleased to hear that they thought it was good enough to include in their best of this year. Uh, so it's the same play, different production, uh, partially different actors, different director, um, but the same, the same piece. So what is it that, that experience like for you to see your work done a couple of times by a few different people each time? How do you uh, keep yourself from becoming too subjective in that process? Oh, well, the first thing to do is to make the very conscious decision not to be the director. I've produced my own work. Uh, I've attempted to direct, but without having the skill for that, the language to uh, tell actors what I want done, um, it's not something that I do readily. So having made the decision not to direct, I can say this is my piece. If you have any questions about how it was put together, what I think the things mean, please ask me. But after that, the gig is yours. <laughs> and I step back and wait to see, just like everybody else, how it's going to work on stage. Uh, 
this particular case it worked extremely well. I was very happy. One, <laughs> two, <laughs> oh, well, Danny, he thinks he's back in the gym and he starts throwing punches all over the place. And, and one of those punches, you know, nails Frankie in the jaw. And Frankie comes back and punches him in the chest. Hey, stop that. He's got a fight tomorrow. You never heard a noisy room go so quiet so fast. We got a chance to see it uh, during one of the earlier productions that mm. during that week of the summer shorts. Mm. But I understand that as it went on that it really grabbed the audience and there was even some tearful moments. I hope so. One, I, try yeah. to, I try to involve an audience. Mm -hmm. I try to make them feel that this is an actual occurrence that they are more than anything else overhearing a real conversation and a real piece of life. That's my goal. And if I can make them laugh, and if I can make them cry, sometimes within seconds of each other, mm. that's what I try to do. Quite a few people would tell me just how moved they were by the piece and how uh, the performances just grabbed them, but just how truthful it was. Uh, there wasn't a wasted moment in the performance from either of them. As, as it matured, I mean, there were a, a couple of moments, you know, I've seen this play, and I think I told you even after the show, there's, mm -hmm. I've seen this play before. Mm -hmm. Of course, I went through all the rehearsals, then, then saw these, and even there was a couple of moments where they even got to me, and I've, I've seen this a bunch of times. But the performances uh, were, were just deepening every night, and that's why I, I could hear it in the audience, too. Wonderful. It's the, it's the beauty of live theater that every performance is going to be different. It's that unpredictability of people saying what if and coming up with different ways of doing that that to me is delicious about theater. That's why I do it. Well, Playwrights Roundtable just affords or offers so many opportunities to see so many different plays. In, in one night you've got a, a beautiful play like West Farms and an equally beautiful but maybe a little more zany play like Seven Second Itch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me think that this organization is just a, a good vehicle for people to to practice their craft, to try a lot of different things, to get some critique and mm -hmm. and, and grow as an artist. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I would agree having been <laughs> part of the group for several for a years long now. Time. <laughs> um, I, I would hope that our, our artists, our, our writers would feel the same. Uh, I, I think it does give a lot of voices a, a chance to be heard, which is one of the interesting things about this. Also interesting with this production, you know, we, we call it best of for lack of a better term, but uh, it, what was interesting to me is like you saw the reinterpretations, if you will, mm -hmm. of earlier stuff. And that to me meant that those lessons, uh, they, they took hold for the writers and they were able to make it work and, and deepen because sometimes you get the right cast and it's it's awesome and then you might get a different group of people who just don't get it but mm -hmm. I think the strength of a play uh, is told by how many times you see it in different interpretations and it's still strong every time and I think that worked with this one and that's one of the things that we try to impart as well is like make your writing stronger and it has helped and so for, for, for people who like to submit uh, that's one of the things that we offer as a group is that you'll get that you'll get that feedback one mm -hmm. and you get the audience feedback too you get our feedback and the audience feedback and that's priceless Joseph any words of wisdom for a budding playwright wanting to get involved would you think that this is a good start starting with a one act or working with playwrights roundtable I think just doing it is the advice that I would give I, I always tell new writers to just do the work Stop expecting to be discovered. Stop expecting the work to magically appear. Just sit down and do it. And do it to the best of your ability and then do it again. Because it takes practice and it takes a certain amount of maturity, not necessarily in age but certainly in mind, to just look at the human condition and portray it as accurately and as truthfully as you possibly can. There's so few avenues for new work in American theater because American theaters are afraid that they're going to alienate their audience if they haven't seen it a dozen times before. So it's the 
potential bravery of organizations like Playwrights Roundtable that keep people like me working because we know that there is a place and hopefully many places for new work, for new chances to ask those questions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for taking a chance on West Farms. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Good. As I'm sure our audience did as well. Thank you both for coming to Playwrights Roundtable and sharing your thoughts on the play with me. And I, of course, look forward to seeing you again soon on yep. another episode of Playwrights Roundtable. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed West Farms, and we'll see you again soon. Take care. <laughs> Playwrights Roundtable provides opportunities for authors to have their work read by professional actors. Members of Playwrights Roundtable have seen their works go from cold readings to workshop productions and on to successful full productions. If you love the craft, Playwrights Roundtable is the place. For more information, contact Playwrights Roundtable at 407-788 8468 or check out the website www.playwrightsroundtable.org